What's up everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today I have two cases for you. They are not directly related, but they are related in theme and they're both very interesting. And that theme is satanic rituals. Thank you for being here and I hope you enjoy. Lloyd Avery was born and raised in Los Angeles, attending Beverly Hills High School and yearning to break into acting. In 1991, he got his first big break when he was cast as Street Thug in John Singleton's movie Boys in the Hood which depicted gang culture and the lives of three young African Americans growing up in South Central LA. The film followed the friendship between Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character Trey Stiles and the Baker Brothers played by Ice Cube and Morris Chestnut. In one of the film's most memorable scenes, Ricky Baker, a promising football star, and Gooding's character go to the local store to pick up groceries. There they spot a group of blood-affiliated gang members, one of whom was played by Avery, and the two split up to escape any trouble. The gang members eventually catch up with Chestnut's character, who is tragically murdered. Avery's character, a gun-toning gang member, is seen leaning out of the window of a bright red sports car and shooting Ricky twice with a double-barreled shotgun, killing him instantly. Not long after the film's release, Avery shocked friends and family when he moved away from his middle-class neighborhood and relocated to an area known as the Jungle. This was a heavily blood-affiliated neighborhood. Lloyd seemed to embrace the culture of his new home and had the word jungles tattooed above his left eyebrow. Friends and co-stars were perplexed by the changes in Avery as he became more entrenched in the gang lifestyle. Despite his newfound status as a gang member, Avery continued to land movie roles. The following year, he was cast as Thug One in the film Poetic Justice, starring alongside his brother who played Thug Two, as well as Janet Jackson, Regina King, and the late Tupac Shakur. Avery was later cast in the film Shot, which documented life on the dangerous streets of LA and would serve as technical advisor on the film, working with director Roger Roth. He offered up his own experience of gang-related life in the jungle, and he even had a prominent appearance on the movie poster. This, however, would be his last acting role. Around this time, his career suffered and his acting work dried up. He was becoming ever more embroiled in the LA gangster culture of drugs, guns, and violence. And in 2005, he became involved in a real-life gang-related incident when he participated in the murders of two drug dealers from a rival gang. His brother remembers the last night he spent with them. The two were sitting in the two-car garage of their grandmother's house on Crenset Heights Boulevard near Beverly Hills. As they sat, talked, and smoked from a bong, he recalled his older brother saying, I've had a good life, as they both continued to smoke. You want to hear something scary? Lloyd asked him. But his brother knew that LA detectives had been searching for his brother to speak with him, and it seemed like he wanted to get something off his chest. But his brother was worried about what he might say. I don't want to hear that crap, Lloyd's brother said. Nothing more was said that evening, and Lloyd spent the night sleeping on the floor in his grandmother's bedroom. It would be his last night as a free man. The next day, Lloyd Avery was apprehended as he left his grandmother's house, riding a bicycle. Seeing a police cruiser tailing him, he pulled alongside the driver's side door of the police cruiser and brazenly leaned forward and asked the officer, what's up? Just then, the officer opened his door and Lloyd took off in an attempt to elude the pursuing police vehicles. He soon collided with another police car and was placed under arrest for the double murders. It appeared Lloyd Avery never got over his prominent role in Boys in the Hood, and it really was a case of art imitating life, with him living the same type of lifestyle as his gun-wielding character in the film. Lloyd's brother, Che Avery, likens his descent into gang life to that of Tupac Shakir. Quote, I'd like to call it the Tupac Syndrome, he says. Quote, Lloyd left like he had something to prove when he really did it. Even if you have money and fame, you will sacrifice all of that just to have respect from a bunch of thugs, end quote. Whilst Avery was awaiting trial, he was incarcerated at the North County Correctional Facility, and it was there that he found God. With the fervor of the newly converted, he spoke often with the prison chaplain about what he was reading in the Bible. He would regularly attend church services on Sundays and was always seen sitting in the front row during Bible study. After two years at the jail, he went to trial and was found guilty for the double homicide and sentenced to life imprisonment. Avery was transferred to Pelican Bay State Prison, where he would serve out his sentence. And while he was there, of course, he continued his religious conversion, and he would often attempt to spread God's words to fellow inmates, and it is believed that this is what caused his death. His cellmate Kevin Roby was a paranoid schizophrenic and a Satan worshiper who had been sentenced to life imprisonment for the sexual assault and murder of his sister while trying to appease Satan. Avery had apparently tried to convert Roby to Christianity, albeit unsuccessful, and was warned by him to stop preaching about God. On September 4th, 2005, 36-year-old Lloyd Avery was hit over the head and strangled to death by his cellmate, who used his body in a ritual of human sacrifice. It would take two days before a CO found his mutilated body in their cell, 
laying on top of a pentagram Roby had drawn on the floor in Avery's own blood for the ritual. Now, Kevin Roby was already in prison for life, but he received another life sentence. Now, Kevin Roby called himself Satanic Christ, and he was a well-known self-avowed Satanist. And Lloyd Avery was a high-profile inmate and self-avowed Christian. Friends and family of Avery blamed the Pelican Bay Correction Officers of negligence, saying the two should never have been placed together in the same cell. It's some people's opinions that prison guards will often stack cells with incompatible cellies to exact revenge for annoying the guards in some manner. It's not my opinion, it's just what some people believe. I don't really know about it. Either way, some people wonder if this wasn't the case when Lloyd Avery and Kevin Roby were placed together. Kevin told prison staff repeatedly that he didn't do Christian cellies. He said he was a hardcore Satanist and wouldn't abide a cellie who professed Christian beliefs, which Avery was obviously very well known for. Additionally, Avery's body would not be discovered for two days, by which time it had started to decay. Multiple times a day, all inmates are required to do a standing count, meaning that they are required to be standing up and not in their bunks to prove that they are alive. How was Avery not discovered during the multiple standing counts during those two days while his corpse was laying in his cell? These details were what lead friends and family of Lloyd's to question what really happened. Was Avery's placement in with Kevin an act of retribution for something light or some rule violation by one of the men? And if so, which one? After the ritual murder of Avery, Kevin actually sued Pelican Bay Prison for placing Avery in a cell with him after he repeatedly warned them not to do so. His lawsuit was dismissed with prejudice. Lloyd chose to live a violent life and ended up dying a particularly violent death. It's an interesting case. It's one I never actually heard of. Uh, because I was a huge fan, I still am, of Boys in the Hood. I remember that scene, like, very vividly in my mind. And until recently, I never even heard this had happened. Now we have two cases for you today. They're different, but they also revolve around the same sort of topic. And that is satanic rituals. So we're going to talk about the Beast of Satan. And this one is super interesting, so thanks for sticking around. So picture a satanic ritual. There are black candles, there are symbols, possibly drawn in blood, and some kind of sacrifice evolved, either animal or human. It's an idea that formed the basis for innumerable horror movies. And then there are times you see it play out in real life. If you look back over the crimes of the last century, some of the worst examples include brutal murders, and some of them have Satan's name attached to them. And that's without having to go back to the Dark Ages. It's an easy explanation for committing unspeakable acts. The devil gets blamed for a lot, right? And in some of the most famous cases of Satan worship, it's not true. Take the McMartin preschool trial in 1983. The trial was representative of the more realistic outrage that took over in the 1980s in America, satanic panic. A mother at preschool faced initial charges of abuse after her son had problems with toileting. The charges then somehow escalated to accusations of flushing children down the toilet to secret rooms and reports of flying witches, among other fantastical and impossible claims. The charges were dropped only in 1990, after a trial that had been going on since 1987 and found no evidence of abuse or satanic ritual. It was one of the longest running court cases in America's history, and was based off of something like that. In many cities across the United States, the SPCA, which is the agency charged with the care of adopting pets, refuses to allow cat adoptions as Halloween approaches due to the number of cat mutilations and sacrifices that occur during this time period. And then there are the cases of horrible abuse and murder of humans that really are linked to Satanism. Real quick, before we go further, if you're thinking about commenting and you're saying something like, you know, screw you, not Satanists aren't bad. I know that a lot of people that are Satanists use it as a belief system that don't, it doesn't actually have anything to do with worshiping the actual Satan. So there are a lot of ways you can look at it. Please don't judge me. I know there's a lot of belief systems out there. So the Beast of Satan was a heavy metal band and they were also a Satanic cult. And there were members of which were tried and convicted of a series of Satanic ritual murders between 1998 and 2004. The slangs were called one of the most shocking crimes in post-war Italy by the BBC. On the evening of the first full moon in January 1998, a group of teens met secretly in the woods to perform a ritual to please their master, Satan. It was an orgy of drugs, death metal music, sex turn rape, and leading to the official murder of two members of the group as a sacrifice to the Dark Lord. They called themselves the Beast of Satan. It was more than just their band name. It was their way of life. No one was safe from their brutal attention, not even their closest friends or fellow group members. 
It was an open season on humanity, after which Italy would never be the same. In the town of Salma Labardo, northwest of Milan, Italy, 19-year-old Chiara Marino and her boyfriend Fabio Tallis, a 16-year-old heavy metal musician, spent a typical Saturday night drinking beer and rocking out to their favorite heavy metal music at the Midnight Pub, one of their favorite regular haunts. It was the last time the couple would be seen alive. They never return home. In the nearby woods, another group of heavy metal enthusiasts were listening to death metal, a subgenre of heavy metal described as featuring lyrics glorifying death and slasher film style violence over a backdrop of pounding repetitive music. Personally, I'm a big fan of the Black Dahlia murder. If anyone's listening to this and you know who they are, you know what's up. Andrea Volpe, Nicola Sapone, and Mario Messione knew the young couple. And in fact, they were all friends, united by their interests in both the heavy metal and drug scenes. The trio of young men invited, although some say allured, Chiara and Fabio out to the woods to party in ways that they couldn't in a public pub. Drugs and death metal were in the offering. Nicola Sapone convinced the teenage Fabio to call his father to tell him not to expect him home that night, as he intended to spend it with his girlfriend. Miguel, his father, got the sense that something was off with his son during the phone call, and after giving it some more thought, he called the midnight pub to question Fabio further. It'd be too late. Fabio and Chiara had already left with the trio. It soon became clear that partying was not the only reason for the get-together in the woods, under a full moon. The three men wanted to perform a ritual to honor and please Satan, and Chiara was the perfect sacrifice. She looked like the Virgin Mary as depicted in the paintings they had seen. As Chiara was stabbed and slashed, Fabio desperately tried to save her. Standing at 6 feet 2 inches and weighing 220 pounds, Fabio was no lightweight but he was soon overpowered by the group and was brought down by repeated hammer blows to the head, the hammer wielded by his one-time friend, Nicola. With Fabio, Chiara's last hope of rescue died as well. She was hacked and stabbed in an orgy of gore and the group infected with bloodlust. The three men dug a large hole in the woods to bury the mangled bodies of Chiara and Fabio. They then danced on the grave and laughed and shouted, now you're both zombies, try to get out of this hole if you dare. Mikael Tallis spent six years investigating the murder of his child. He discovered just how deeply the group, of which his son Fabio was a loosely affiliated member, was deeply involved in Satanism and the occult, both common themes of black metal and death metal music scenes. Although, again, I'm a fan of this type of metal. I'm not going out and doing this stuff, so don't, don't judge me. One detail discovered by Tallis is that the group had named themselves the Beast of Satan. Becoming convinced of a connection between Satanism and the disappearance of Fabio and Chiara, Mikhail spent the next six years steadily constructing a file on their activities and the bands in which they played. When the group murdered their next victim, which we'll talk about, Mikhail took his findings to the police, who were able to use them to link all of the murders to this group. To be fair, no one has been charged in the murders of the victims we are about to discuss, although investigators are certain, to the point they are willing to name names, that the satanic group are responsible for the deaths of 15 more individuals in increasingly sadistic ways. And again, many of these crimes were and still are open and unsolved, likely due to linkage blindness. Between technological and training handicaps, and a pure lack of gumption in some cases, the net result is a phenomenon called linkage blindness. Linkage blindness prevents investigators from interpreting related murder cases from being properly consolidated and seen as a part of a series. It exists even in the 21st century, despite extremely effective linkage and tracking tools available to modern detectives. Interestingly, while violent crime has been decreasing in the United States and worldwide since the mid-90s, the clearance rate, which is the rate of cases that are solved, has been declining even more steadily. There are far fewer murders per 100 murder that are solved today than there were in the 70s and 60s, when none of today's technology was available. One theory is that there are simply more stranger-on-stranger -stranger murders than ever before. Such murders are inevitably more difficult to solve because there is no sort list of usual suspects and no known connection between victims and killers. Although it's been pointed out that the gumshoe detective work conducted by Mikhail, a layperson, is what solved and brought this homicidal group to bay. So it was January 2004 when Mary Angela Pezzata hung up the phone, still surprised that her ex, Andrea Volpe, had invited her to dinner. They hadn't parted on the best of terms, but she was willing to bury the hatchet, maybe even reminisce over better times that they had shared. Volpe had other ideas. 
Mary Angela would last be seen leaving her home to meet with Volpe. Instead of dinner, Mary Angela walked into an ambush. Deciding that she had known too much about the group's crimes, including the murders of Fabio and Chiara, and that she was a threat that needed to be neutralized. Andrea Volpe and his new fiance, 18 year old high school student Elisabetta Ballerin, high on drugs, shot her in the throat, mutilated her, and tortured her as she lay bleeding out. They dedicated the resulting gore fest to Satan. Andrea discovered that Mary Angela wasn't dead, as he thought. He called Nicolo Sapone for help, who taunted him. You can't even kill a person. Andrea and Nicola hit her in the head with a shovel several times before they buried her, somehow still alive, in the dirt floor of a greenhouse located on the property of the Bellarine family home. Nicola then returned home, acting as if nothing had happened. Later that night, Andrea and his girlfriend decided to get rid of Mary Angela's car. They planned to drive it into the river and submerge it, but on the way, high on heroin and cocaine, they crashed the car and were arrested. During the investigation, armed with the dossier compiled by Mikkel, Andrea confessed to Mary Angela's murder and the earlier slaying of Fabio and Chiara, leading them to their shallow grave in the woods. It was the first time the police learned of the existence of the Beast of Satan sect. Questioning the other members, Mario Messione, the self-styled medium of the group and Fabio's best friend, admitted to killing him by repeatedly beating him in the head with a hammer after the couple had been stabbed by the other members. Investigators also learned the insane fact that the other members had pushed the band's drummer to commit suicide because he had refused to join the band in murdering Fabio and Chiara. In September 1998, the drummer, also named Andrea, consumed a large quantity of alcohol and then killed himself by deliberately crashing his car. After a protracted and well-attended trial, on February 22, 2005, Andrea Volpe was sentenced to 30 years confinement for his role in the three slayings, which was 10 years more than the prosecutor had actually asked for. And Petro, another member of the group, received 16 years. Hopefully I said that name right. Mario Messione, who had participated in the same crimes, was cleared and received no prison time due to what was described as his secondary role in the case in his cooperation with law enforcement. In early 2006, Nicola Sapone, leader of the group and a suspected mastermind behind the killings, received a life sentence. The other four that were in the group received sentences between 24 and 26 years for the roles in the three murders. In 2007, the Court of Appeal confirmed the life sentence of Nicola Sapone and lengthened the convictions of three other members of the group. In May of 2008, the final court confirmed all of the appeal's decisions. Reactions to the sentences were kind of mixed. Mikkel said he had received justice, whereas Chiara's mother, upon hearing the sentence, would cry. They are murderers. It's not fair. I guess she thought that 24 years in life uh, for the leader was not enough. The crimes of the Beast of Satan group gripped Italy, home to one of the largest sects of Catholics in the world, and to the Vatican and the Pope, obviously. It seemed that Satanism was growing in popularity among Italy's disaffected youth. In response, a Roman Catholic university connected to the Vatican began offering a course on diabolical possession and exorcism for priests and seminarians. There was also a concerted effort to ban death metal, because as one priest explained, quote, if music makes itself an instrument of nefarious deeds and death, it should be stopped, end quote. Based on what was learned during the trials of the Beast members, police announced their intention to create a new special unit focusing on satanic groups active in Italy and would include a psychologist and a priest who specialized in the occult. During the wide-range investigation into the Beast of Satan murders, both those known and suspected, it was discovered that an estimated 5,000 Italians were practicing Satanists. The large majority were teens and young adults in their 20s. And this is the same age a lot of people, if they're going to, begin their criminal careers. So it might be more of a coincidence. So thanks for checking out this episode. Next week we are talking about something kind of crazy and involves aliens and pilots and all sorts of cool stuff. If you've gotten this far, I appreciate it. Like the video if you want. If you don't want to, that's cool too. Send us an email if you have anything you want to say. And we will see you next week. Again, death metal rules. Love you all. Bye.